Welcome back. Happy to be back here. Thank you, Torsten. I really like our soundtrack. I really like this uh, uh, new video opening that we're having. Thank you very much to the production. So it's Emma here. Just another couple of details before uh, we start. First of all, as usual, when we are alive, when we live, we are alive, uh, we run our traditional space raffle. So how does it work? Just comment with the hashtag Artemis in any chat, whether you are on StreamYard, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, Unfortunately, on X doesn't work, so it's not our fault. But whatever you're following us, just type hashtag Artemis and you can win. Uh, you can enter the raffle and win a T-shirt at the end of the show. So good luck with that. And don't forget hashtag Artemis. Second, but not for importance, allow me to thank all our Business Club members for their support. We are a small independent group, independent journalists based in, uh, in Europe. And what allows us to keep alive and to see alive is... Uh, uh, the business club. So people that join it and they support our ind independent journalists. We really appreciate that. If you want to know how to join our business club, just see the banner below and click in the link we are pre putting in the chat. So everyone can click the link and everyone can check us out. So, uh, as so a couple of uh, information for those of you who don't know Space Watch Global. We are a platform that produces podcasts, produces video, produces newsletter, and we are focused on everything that comes with geopolitics and science uh, and the economy of space. So, if you want to know more about this, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter. We have a daily one, we have a weekly one, and we have a space communication newsletter curated by my very own self. It's called Nobody Cares About Your Satellite. It's a bit provocative, but if you like this kind of stuff, sign it up. You can see in the chat uh, the link to sign it up. So join the community. Uh, last but not least, no, no, it's not the last we're coming towards. Uh, we just passed the 103rd edition of our Space Cafe podcast with Marcus Muschler. So don't miss the last one with Rahum Romero. And in the chat, we are putting uh, the, um, the chat, the, 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 the link to listen to it, and more important, to follow our podcast channel. We also have a lot of other Space Cafe radios. The last one is with Dalian Erickson of Transparency International. The best way to stay updated with all our production is to sign up and to follow us on Spotify. So again, on our chat, we are putting all the links to, to follow us. And of course, if you want to become a Space Watchers, don't forget to visit our fan shop, which is on our website when you can purchase our T-shirt, our mugs. And again, this all helps to support our independent journalism. OK, we're done with the presentation and introduction. And I think we can finally start. How are we doing? Perfect. OK, hello, everyone. This is our Space Cafe 35 minutes with uh, minutes live, which today might be a bit longer than our usual 33 minutes because we are having two guests. Uh, but we will try to stay within 45 minutes maximum. Our esteemed guests today are Mike Gold, the Chief Growth Officer at Redwire. Hello, Mike. How are you doing? It's wonderful to be here. I just hope I can still win a T-shirt, though. I'm going to have to make a comment. <laughs> Hashtag Artemis. Don't forget that. Uh, so Mike is, uh, uh, um, prior to joining Redwire, Mike was NASA's Associate Administrator for Space Policy and Partnership, Acting Associate Administrator for the Office of International and Interagency Relations at, and Senior Advisor to the Administrator for International Legal Affairs. At NASA, Mike led the development and implementation of the Artemis Accords. When I asked Torsen, Torsen, I want somebody expert on Artemis, and he said, Mike Gold. He is Artemis. So you've been presented with very high level credential, Mike. Well, the world is Artemis. The world is Artemis, not just me. That's true. Our second guest and first timer, I think, on Space Watch Global is Dr. Rodrigo Leonardi, the director of the Brazilian Space Agency. Rodrigo. Hi, how are you, Emma? Hi, Mike. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's indeed my first time. I'm here today uh, speaking with you from the headquarters of the Brazilian Space Agency located in Brasilia, Brazil. 
Fantastic. We can feel the warmth already. So Rodrigo is a mathematician and astrophysicist. He has worked at the University of California, Santa Barbara. I approve the choice. Rodrigo, fantastic, fantastic place. He has collaborated on various initiatives <clears throat> and projects on a national and international level, working closely in collaboration with the academic community, industry and government. Nowadays, Rodrigo has taken on the role of coordinating Brazil engagement with their Artemis Accords framework for space exploration. So again, the perfect guess for the topic that we want to discuss today. Rodrigo, you might need to close your uh, mic because maybe we're having a bit of echo and I'm just going to be afraid that we're going to just talk to on the top of each other. Thank you very much. So what's the question that we want to debate today? How will the geopolitical interest on Earth shape the future of the, main, uh, of the moon exploration? Let me give you a bit of background on how this uh, question rose in our mind. It's part from a recent meeting in our news newsroom. We were just discussing the latest space news, and I found myself wondering if there are any countries out there signing on to both the Artemis Accords and the Chinese-led International Lunar Research Station which from now on I'm going to call ILRS because it's shorter. So it turns out, as of today, as, 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 as long as I know, the answer is no. There are no countries that sign both, uh, both programs. The ILRS, in case you don't know it, includes eight members at the moment. Uh, this includes, of course, heavy hitters like China and Russia, but also Venezuela, South Africa, Azerbaijan, Pakistan, Belarus, and Egypt. The Artemis Accord is much more. I think we enter 36 members, and the, the majority of the Western countries have signed uh, the Artemis Accords and much more, of course. Uh, so here is where um, the topic becomes a bit interesting because some of the nations that have signed uh, the ILRS, uh, the China-led program, are also part of BRICS. BRICS is a very important intergovernmental coalition promoting collaboration among Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, and the United Arab Emirates. So as you can see, there are some interesting uh, overlapping because we have in Brazil, we have in India, we have in the UAE, which are signing the Artemis Accords, but uh, they also belong to BRICS. BRICS a group in which there are members which instead belong to the other coalition. So if you can imagine a sort of um, Venn diagram, you will see the BRICS can, can nations at the center and then split into different uh, uh, moon programs. So as you can imagine, this is not an easy situation given, given the nature of the beast, given the nature of space exploration, because how space is conducted, uh, we know it requires procurements, uh, it needs a lot of uh, security, it's connected with defense, it's connected with espionage. Um, so my question today uh, for, 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 our, for our guest, Rodrigo, but of course then we will talk also to Mike, is how do countries like Brazil, for example, balance this competing interest? And uh, what about the US? How will the US navigate this uh, complex landscape of lunar diplomacy and, and shifting alliances? So let's explore today together this intricate interplay of geopolitics and lunar politics, which apparently it might be called selenopolitics. I don't know if maybe I'm making it up, but we might come up with a new word at the end of this interview. <laughs> Mike, let's start from you. Uh, let's just open the stage with the more broad question. How are the geopolitical interests of Earth shaping their Artemis Accords, in your opinion? Over to you. Thank you. So Emma is a recovering attorney. I can't help but answer the question I want to be asked. So let me <laughs> reverse that a little bit and talk about how the Artemis Accords are shaping the geopolitics of Earth. Because I think that gets back to a, a fundamental rationale of the Artemis Accords and the Artemis Program, which is to bring the world together. Nothing unites humanity like space exploration. It draws out the best in all of us. And what's so important about the Artemis Program isn't just building new technology or better rocket systems. It's about building a better future for all of us on Earth. And the goal of Artemis, and particularly the Artemis Accords, was always to create the broadest, most diverse global human spaceflight program in history. And as you mentioned, with 36 signatories, 
we're well on our way to achieving that. And I've been particularly pleased by the diversity of the geographies that we've gotten and very, very grateful to Rodrigo in Brazil for early adoption, for coming on board quickly and for their tremendous support of the Artemis program, the Artemis Accords and norms of behavior in space generally, especially at a time where we're facing so much conflict and strife on earth. The Accords represent a way to bring countries and different people together. So I see the Accords and the Artemis program as a whole as influencing geopolitics to overcome challenges, to overcome conflicts and bring the whole world together. Per the topic of the conversation, the Accords are about finding common ground, not separating countries out. And I believe that any nation that has signed the Outer Space Treaty can and should sign the Artemis Accords. I'll just end by saying that our journey of Artemis is to the moon and eventually Mars, but the purpose of the Accords through having norms of behavior to prevent conflict, to share scientific information, that destination is peace and prosperity. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much for this vision and this uh, um, global view about the Artemis uh, Accords. Rodrigo, over to you. Uh, when it comes to Brazil, which are Brazil's primary objectives uh, concerning uh, moon exploration and its involvement in the Artemis Accords? Because as Mike said, you guys jump on board quite early. So, of course, you, you're quite you, you're well a part of the project. Well, thank you for the question. Indeed, we have we were the very first nation in, in South America to join the Artemis Accords. We have signed the agreement uh, in 2021, basically three years ago. And just in the following year, we have included Artemis as an uh, initiative of, of our Brazilian space program, meaning that after signing, uh, let's say, a more diplomatic intention on how to uh, behave and proceed engagement on uh, moon exploration, we have uh, translated it into a, a government project, government program in Brazil. That was an important milestone. And since then, we've been uh, discussing with our community, our industry, and also our uh, uh, partners, how to engage. Brazil, as you, you may know, we have already a, a reasonable uh, space program with several initiatives for Earth observation. So low Earth orbit has been our must since uh, we, have, we have engaged in space, uh, in space activities. And exploration is something that we don't have previous experience. So we are using uh, uh, the Artemis Accords as an opportunity for us to open a new chapter in our space program regarding uh, space exploration. And of course, we, we, we will benefit from engaging with partners that they have proven experience in these activities. And uh, we, there are several, I uh, know, uh, roadmaps for a nation like Brazil to engage in, in, in moon exploration. But at the moment, we are not tasking or targeting transportation or, or, or infrastructure or even operations. We, we aim to start with science. Science, we have, you know, it will be a bottom up approach. We have excellent scientists that they can engage with organizations, universities, research institutes uh, all over the world to contribute and add value to the uh, uh, this uh, Artemis initiative. And as soon as possible, we will get a more mature understanding on where Brazil can specifically add value and make contributions for the Artemis initiatives. We already have two ongoing uh, projects in Brazil. One is a, a small sand for space weather that we want to deploy around the moon by the end of the decade. We're very excited with that one. Although it's a small satellite, is in the, our envelope of engineering expertise. So we're very confident that we may be uh, capable of delivering that. And we also were very, very interested in, in contributing uh, on space resources related topics, mostly uh, targeting space farming. Just recently, we have organized here uh, the first uh, space farming workshop in Brazil, and we've been discussing these possibilities with our partners. It's again, uh, an idea that we, are, we, we want to invent. But let me repeat it. We don't have 
ex previous experience in space exploration. As an agency, I'm doing the task of building a community that can benefit and engage in Artemis-related activities. That's number one priority in the Brazilian Space Agency these days. So it's building up, building a structure within the Brazilian community, because of course uh, you cannot, Rome wasn't built in a day, so you cannot invent aeronautics engineers today. So as we all know, it takes time to, to grow a, a, a school of students that can actually participate. And uh, there is nothing wrong with small satellites, I think. So it's like, uh, it's really nice to see, and they are complex enough. And we all know that we have seen it recently that going to the moon is not easy. So nothing wrong with, with small satellites, absolutely. Thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, Mike, so how do you anticipate um, the Artemis Accords addressing countries exactly like Brazil, but maybe also like India or like the UAE, which uh, are involved in the Artemis Accords? We just heard uh, Rodrigo's goal, but they also maintain ties with China for other, com you know, for other, because they also have other goals, of course. So again, there's nothing about the Accords that's exclusionary. The Accords were intended to be an inclusive document to unite countries to find common ground that would bring us all together. So there's nothing inherent to the Accords that prevents cooperation. As a matter of fact, we certainly hope that the Accords set a precedent that even non-signatories would follow. So as we look at the values of the Accords, transparency, the full free and open sharing of scientific information, avoiding conflict, debris mitigation, by committing to these principles, and again, we're so grateful to have Brazil uh, as part of the Artemis Accords and to be leading in the first in that region, we think you're setting a precedent, you're setting a pathway that for the entire world shows what good looks like in terms of space exploration. And at their core, the Accords are a preemptive strike against conflict, that the idea is to create rules of the road, transparency, ways of behaving that allow for peaceful interactions and to create a environment that is conducive to private sector development. We recently saw intuitive machines land on the moon. We were very proud at Redwire to have a camera, hazard debris camera on that mission. We're going to see more private sector operations, more diverse amounts of countries. And I hope that when Brazil and Brazilian astronauts are on the moon, through the Artemis Accords, we will have peaceful operations and I'll just end by saying one other very important value of the Accords, interoperability, that we don't want to get to the moon and have AC versus DC. I'll date myself. With the chapter data. We need to ensure that we can communicate, that we have interoperability, both to allow for joint exercises, be that international, be that commercial, or for conducting rescue operations. The more interoperable systems are, the better we're going to be able to support the agreement on the rescue of astronauts. So again, the Accords are a unifying document and we're setting precedents that any country should and I hope will follow. Thank you, Mike. Uh, allow me to challenge you for a second. So I, I agree with your vision and agree with your statement completely. Um, I just want to reflect a bit on the, the distance sometimes between uh, the vision and reality, because albeit I agree with you and the vision of the Accords is a unifying document to bring transparency and a peaceful use of, uh, of the moon among all nations. Then when it comes to Earth geopolitics, we are all aware there are um, important tensions between some countries. And then when it comes to space, especially space technology, uh, it becomes kind of difficult, like the UAE, for example, is a good example. They have quite close ties with, with China, but then when it comes to working together also with the US and with China, there are some kind of like limits that somehow um, they've been posed to don't allow, you know, uh, in a sort of way, what can be considered a delicate industrial secret just to be transmitted to what are perceived at the moment like i'm not gonna i don't like the word enemies because it's a bit belligerent but you know like let's call them competitor in a sort of way so can you uh, if we can step out a bit outside of the theoretical framework how do you think uh, the us will deal with countries that they perceive 
uh, a bit too close to what is at the moment a very strong competitor, China. So you've always got export controls, and that's an important part of the policy regime. And there are certain nations that obviously we don't want to share technology with due to an adversarial relationship. And that's very important relative to national security, economic security. So you're always going to have those in place. However, as we move up a stage to space policy, I believe that all nations have more in common than we have differences. The Artemis Accords in many ways are implementing the obligations of the Outer Space Treaty. I hope everyone in your audience is familiar with the Outer Space Treaty. You know, it's a short read, real page turner, but consider it the constitution, the backbone, the spine of international space law. The only problem with the Outer Space Treaty, it's a treaty of principles, it's very high level. And what the Accords try to do is implement those obligations in a fashion that can be operationalized. China, like the US and even Russia, are all parties to the Outer Space Treaty. Therefore, again, there should be more that brings us together than separates us relative to space policy. Certainly, there are geopolitical challenges with China relative to you know, the freedom that we hold so dear here in the US and in Brazil, uh, equality, freedom of speech, et cetera, Taiwan. But I believe in space policy, there is an opportunity to collaborate. Because again, I think there's more that unites us than separates us. And to be clear, there isn't a prohibition per se on working with the Chinese right now. NASA has collaborated with China relative to Mars traffic management when United Arab Emirates, for example, which has done so much in such a short of time. It's been stunning to watch the progress of UAE so we had the HOPE mission in Mars orbit, America, India. India has also done amazing things. Hope to see Brazil there soon. So we had to coordinate with China on traffic management. We're also, and I need to stop saying we when we talk about NASA, so be clear, I'm speaking for myself personally, but the agency is working with China relative to global climate issues. And I believe space policy is another area where there can be a win-win for both countries. So I certainly don't want to deny or in any way demean the critical issues that do separate us as nations. But space is unique in an area where I think we could come together relative to space policy. And again, the accords were written in an inclusive fashion to ensure that any country, particularly those that are signatories to the Outer Space Treaty, can come together with common principles and common ideas. Thank you very much, Mike. So, Rodrigo, back to you. Um, you already gave me partially the, the, the answer before, but maybe we can explore a bit more the vision of Brazil when it comes to the Artemis Accord. So you told me before that like, we're just starting, we're open up, opening up a door, we want to see where it takes us. But in general, how, how do you think Brazil can wield its influence to shape the Moon Accords and the broader landscape of lunar exploration? You mentioned before a small satellite, what else do you think you guys you guys can bring on the plate when it comes to the to the moon exploration? You can well, also give me a, a, a general long term view. Well, you know, I know uh, that we. It's, well, it's, no, we, we could be talking about Artemis for hours and hours, right? But uh, regarding your question, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to emphasize that we in Brazil we have a diplomatic tradition of engaging with all nations, so you know, and we aim to continue doing so. And, uh, you know, we, we've been on Artemis since as early as possible. Indeed, uh, there's a lot of uh, commercial and, and other activities going on in the BRICS framework. But we are also at the G20. This year, Brazil is hosting the G20. We're going to have a, uh, an event September this year so of heads of space agencies of the G20 in Brazil. I hope we can welcome uh, uh, our colleagues uh, from the G20. We also have in regional, you know, thinking about South America, we also have Mercosur, which is important uh, uh, framework as well. Some of these nations from South America, they have recently joined Artemis, Argentina, Uruguay, Colombia. We could as well think about how Latin America could, uh, you know, contribute for, for Artemis. And we have some uh, partners that are among these groups that they also have recently joined the ILRS, and we wish them all the best and we wish them success 
in going to the moon as well. So we are open to, to dialogue with anyone. And regarding where this, where is the best forum for us to have this conversation, I believe that still the best place for us is the United Nations. That, that's the, the place where we can seriously talk about what's the best way to, uh, to engage. And, uh, and, and, and how we can explore the moon and use it for the benefit of whole, whole human humanity. I was double checking uh, the moon agreement from 1984 and somewhere it states that the moon and its natural resources are the common heritage of mankind and that an international regime should be established to govern the exploitation of such resources. So, if you go back in the past, probably 1984, that was more an abstraction, right? No, it, it, it's, it's a very high, high, high level uh, idea, as Mike was saying. And now I think with nowadays context, which is very dynamic, it's changing on, on a daily basis. Uh, I, I, um, the International Lunar Research Station, it's easier for me to, to spell that way, was announced in the same year we joined ART. I mean, so it's, it's a brand new world out there. Just, you know, in the last three years, everything has been changing very fast. And, you know, whatever happens, happen on the moon surface, uh, you know, um, it will need dialogue here on the surface of Earth. And we see ourselves as a player that can engage and dialogue with all the partners, all the stakeholders regarding peaceful use of outer space on the moon. Thank you, Rodrigo. I think you touched two, two very important points, the UN roles, of course, because uh, we recently saw a, 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 I don't know if I can call it a disclaimer or a letter from China to the COPUS uh, a working team about the moon resources. And uh, I think one of the bottom line of the, of the document that we have been debating this in our newsroom was uh, the, 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 the desire of China that the UN keeps being a sort of guiding light or administrative uh, or, um, body for what uh, will become the new regulatory framework when it comes to the moon resources. Uh, the moon treaty is very interesting. You mentioned that. I think um, one of the is, is, is a good example. Mike, correct me, but if I could remember correctly, the US did not sign the moon treaty in the 1984, no, correct? Neither exactly. did China, nor Neither did China, of course. <laughs> I think Italy did. <laughs> it was that. <laughs> uh, yes, so they, that kind of opens up a Pandora's box that I don't want to open up today because this is on something else, but it brings up the, the, the matter of um, moon resources, lunar resources, and how private companies and government will be able to regulate, reg, you know, regulate that in a way that is still respect the OST, the Outer Space Treaty, or uh, the concept of resources for humanity. But as you say, Rodrigo, I agree, we are in a different world. Uh, so many things have changed. Uh, probably um, everything has to be updated, keeping always in mind the concept of cooperation and peaceful use of uh, outer space. Mike, over to you. Um, you already partially answered me this question before, but I'm going to uh, ask, ask this question again just in case uh, um, somebody just tuned in now because I saw a higher number of people following us on YouTube. So is the division between uh, signatories of the Artemis Accords and the LRS an implicit understanding or there are actually explicit provisions within the Artemis Accords bearing collaboration with the LRS? I know you already gave me the answer. Yeah, but there's absolutely nothing in the Accords that would prohibit countries from working with other countries. That's anathema to the spirit of the Accords, which is to bring together nations as much as possible to explore the heavens. I would, again, turn the question around somewhat about how the Accords and these principles can bring us all together rather than how we're separated. I don't believe the question is U.S. versus China or Accords families versus ILRS, the question is safety and transparency versus being opaque. It's being open and releasing scientific information versus not. It's about coordination, communication, interoperability versus not talking to each other. So there's nothing inherent to ILRS that would hopefully represent a violation of those activities. Now, I haven't seen the specifics of ILRS agreements but my great hope is that they're reflective, generally, of the principles of the Accords. 
And what the Artemis Accords support and the Artemis Accords family of nations is these principles of transparency, of safety. And it's not countries that anyone is against. What we're against is danger of putting people in jeopardy, of not communicating, of not being transparent. So it's really a matter of values. And if the ILRS reflects those values, there's absolutely nothing inherent that prevents one country from signing both documents. Again, I believe there's more that unites us on this topic than separates us. And I'm grateful for countries like Brazil that maybe have a foot in both worlds and can hopefully ensure that ILRS operations, what China does, et cetera, uh, is in keeping with the principles of the Accords of Transparency, of safety, of openness, of interoperability. I believe that we can all work together and there's nothing in the Accords that prevents that future vision. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Uh, last question for Rodrigo, and then we move to the Q&A session with our uh, uh, audience. So um, Brazil obviously has signed the Artemis Accords, but I would like to understand how you think, and I know this is a kind of open question, Rodrigo, you probably can more give me your personal opinion, but how do you think Brazil intends to strike a balance between its commitments to the Artemis Accords and its commercial relations with China here on Earth? already on balance, I would say. Uh, no, both uh, the US and China, they are very important commercial, commercial partners for Brazil. And we work with both of them on space as well. We have a very uh, fruitful cooperation with China on Earth observation. We have the program called CBERS. Uh, we have been we have launched six satellites with China already, and all the data is made public uh, uh, to, to any user in the world that would like to, to use it. And we have another satellite in the pipeline in the making. That, that being said, we also have a very long historical cooperation with the US in space. Actually, the very first uh, space object, if you can label it like that, launched from Brazil was a uh, Nike Apache American sounding rocket. It was launched from Brazil in 65. And after that milestone, we started investing in sounding rockets. And nowadays we have very, very uh, good Brazilian sounding rockets that we, we launched them on a regular basis. And just recently also we launched a, 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 a micro satellite for, for our space weather uh, research as well named SPORT. So we, we, we want to keep working with both nations. We have, of course, separated initiatives. And uh, the way it stands today is that uh, we have been engaging in lunar exploration uh, on the Artemis framework with not only the US, but the US and nowadays 34 other nations. And, and we want to see this list to become bigger. And we've been discussing with China uh, several uh, key aspects of space activities. And why not? We should as well understand better the uh, International Lunar Research Station framework. And in the future, if there are bridges that we can build and cooperate, it's always a possibility. The, 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 as Mike says, the doors are not uh, closed. They're indeed open. We want all these uh, uh, initiatives to succeed. And, uh, uh, and again, we have signed the Artemis Accords principles because they are in sync with the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. So we're just stating something that we have stated several decades ago. And, and we aim to uh, continue our space program for peaceful use of outer space with transparency. Uh, interoperability, it's complicated. I should call my engineer to see what we have signed it for, but you know, the principles are there, and we always try to, uh, to do our best uh, uh, to, to have, uh, I'd say, uh, fruitful international corporations for all of us in bilateral relationships as well, multilateral, multilateral. relationships, which is what we see these days with nations going to the moon. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, let's say that like countries like India or Brazil, as you said, you know, they can be also a very interesting bridge sometimes between tension and maybe keep these doors open and helping to smooth some relationship in case uh, uh, the sea gets rough sometimes uh, between the, the major players. So, thank you very much. Okay, let's take some questions. I have some very interesting question here. Um, okay, to what extent is it Luha? First of all, thank you for the question. To what extent is it still realistic to believe in a collective action, international approach that is driven by the global south, given the increasingly strong first come, first served rhetoric of some established space nation? Do we still believe in a space as a global commons? It's a fair question. Who wants to take it? I think this is for both of you. <laughs> Do we believe we should at least work? Towards that. And let me give you a very realistic example. International Space Station. No matter what is the geopolitical of today's context, you have Europe, Russia, and the United States cooperating, like it or not, in the International Space Station. So it's a real example that in space, if you have a pragmatic approach, you may navigate the complications of uh, geopolitics, because if you think about the moon, it's a long, long-term vision. It's not whatever happens in three, five years. So you, you need to go with that approach. So we have a realistic example happening right now, International Space Station. Like it or not, we continue working together there. So this may happen on the moon as well. So it, it, I think it's not a rhetoric, it, it is, it's real. It's, it's not easy, it's complicated, but you have an example right there. Mike, thank you, Rodrigo. Yeah, I think this question is at least implicitly asking about space resources as well. And we're going back to the moon this time to stay, that we must establish a permanent and ongoing human lunar presence and then move that on to Mars. And unless we can extract and utilize resources on the moon, unless we can learn to live off the land, that won't be possible. It'll be much more dangerous, much more difficult. So I'm so excited about this future of being able to find ways to use water ice on the moon, to create air, to create fuel. And I think there are concerns that are probably premature since with the Artemis program, and I think most of the activities that are going to occur on the moon are all going to be in support of scientific development and scientific discovery. And that's primarily what the Accords were developed to do. That being said, the private sector has a significant role. I'm very proud at Redwire. We're developing a system called Mason that will help create landing pads and even streets, berms, structures to support development on a lunar basis. And we need to ensure that policy keeps pace with the technology. And that's the idea with the Artemis Accords and why we move quickly and relative to the global south. Again, I'm so grateful to Rodrigo and Brazil for coming on when they did. I think it opened the doors for other countries in the region to sign on to the Accords. And now when we have these conversations about space resources, about the future of lunar governance, the South not only will have a seat at the table, but will be leading that conversation, will be an active participant. And that's so important, not only to the benefit of America, but to all of the Artemis Accords family of nations and ultimately the entire world. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm gonna um, hitch on, on the question of the first come for served. Um, do you think the Artemis Accords are there to to prevent this first come for served effect, which obviously makes some nation feel a bit? Edgy. So I think the Artemis Accords, as I stated previously, were designed to implement the obligations of the Outer Space Treaty, to ensure that we're taking these values of the Outer Space Treaty, which are just as relevant today as they were in 1967, to create peace, to share science, to work collaboratively together. Relative to first come, first serve, the Accords don't address that issue explicitly. And even when we talk about space resources, the Accords are relatively modest in what they say, which is that you can extract resources, you can utilize resources, such activities should be done in a sustainable manner, 
in keeping with all the relevant provisions of the Outer Space Treaty and don't inherently represent appropriation. So I think that was a small step forward, but an important one policy-wise relative to if there should be a sharing regime or what will occur once you extract and benefit from those resources. That's a debate that has yet to be had, and I know it's discussions that are occurring right now on the Committee of the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space and within ANUSA. My hope, though, is that we can be realistic relative to what these resources are. I'm a big science fiction fan, but I try and keep science fiction in my personal life as opposed to my professional one. And I feel like films like Avatar have done a great disservice, that the resources that we develop on the moon are primarily, if not at the beginning, entirely going to be dedicated to supporting scientific missions. So I think it's very important that we come together to ensure that we can utilize those resources to make the discoveries of tomorrow, to create great science, and to share those scientific discoveries with the world. And Rodrigo, I'm enough of an attorney where I keep, keep <laughs> yeah. talking. So, uh, He's I'm back. Talking Thank you, Mike. <laughs> so one for the team, Mike. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome back, Rodrigo. A conversation from the moon sooner. Sometimes we don't have a signal flowing. That's not a problem. But speaking about uh, resources, I'm glad you mentioned that, Mike. We have a question actually about space resources. Um, in the Artemis context and beyond the UN Corpus framework, how can we improve access to and sharing of lunar activities, insights, and benefits? Thank you, Christoph. It's a great question. And thanks for acknowledging Luxembourg, which is another Artemis Accords nation that's done great work on this topic of lunar resources. We're very proud of Redwire to developing robotics in Luxembourg that could hopefully eventually scoop up and utilize these resources. The important issue when it comes to sharing, and we ensconce this in the Accords, is to share the scientific data, to share the discoveries that the Artemis Accords explicitly require any country that joins to share their information, share the science. So no matter where you are, if you have an internet connection, you can join us on this journey of discovery. You can review the scientific information on a free, timely, and open basis. And we already heard Rodrigo talk about how he's supporting the principles of the Accords, even in Earth orbit with satellites. So while we perhaps can't share the actual resource that's collected, we can share the data, we can share the science, and that's going to benefit all of humanity. Thank you very much. Uh, and let me see the time. Uh, I want to, okay, we should close down. So I'm gonna take uh, the final question by Jay Harwood. Uh, do the transparency values of the Artemis Accords have any significant effect upon the commercial companies, especially for human space flight? Do expect that, which I don't know if it's an exclamation or what, but I would say, I mean, fair, fair point. We have spoke about transparency, but we know that when it comes to commercial companies, transparency is a bit more of a nuanced word. Uh, what do you guys think? So I certainly believe that the Accords and their values of not just transparency, but of avoiding conflict, of sharing scientific information, debris mitigation, interoperability, these will all have an impact on the private sector for the better. Interoperability, as I mentioned previously, is so important, creating an environment that's conducive for international and commercial development. However, it's also important to point out that the Artemis Accords cover civil space activities. So it's the activities of governments. The Accords only cover the commercial sector to the extent that the private sector is acting on the behest of a government. So I think it's important to view the Accords as a beginning of a conversation, not an ending. And we have a lot of work to do together as a family of nations, Brazil, the US and the world to determine norms of behavior, rules of road, both commercial activities and eventually national security activities as well. Thank you very much. So uh, we have other very interesting questions and uh, I, I'm torn between closing down to don't waste anybody's time by actually getting them. Um, I'm gonna take one from Henrik, which is specifically for Rodrigo, I suppose. Um, it's a very long question, but I think the bottom line is like, any practical purposes uh, to involve the rest of Latin, Latin American countries? Uh, Brazil is a sort of island uh, compared to the rest of the South American uh, continent. 
Uh, Rodrigo, I'll, I'll leave it to you. This is a very specific one for you, I suppose. Uh, I thought to myself as an island, uh, in comparison to the rest of, of the region, and uh, we have uh, some space agencies that uh, we respect very much and we work together. Uh, just to mention Conai in Argentina, we have several initiatives uh, with that. And we also be engaging uh, with other nations as well. Mexico also has, uh, you know, it's an important uh, player for, for, for the region. I would say that for all of us in Latin America and South America, moon exploration is something brand new. Okay? It wasn't in the portfolio or in the radar of most of us because we've been approaching space from a pragmatic way of you know, service to society, earth observations, telecommunications, you know, uh, science, technology, research, the, the basic, you know, uh, uh, the basic uh, pieces of the puzzle that you, you have to put in place if you want to be a player in, 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 in space. And we are just starting a, a brand new uh, uh, chapter for, for all of us. So give us some time. We should as well discuss with our partners opportunities. For instance, Uruguay just signed it what, a few weeks ago and didn't have a chance to call Uruguay and say, What's your opinion? Why did you join Arctic? And uh, but NASA is providing us a place to discuss. This year, last year, we had a, a workshop in, uh, in Poland for. Uh, signatories of uh, the Artemis Accords, and the question was, how are space emerging nations can engage? And it's a very complex uh, uh, question. And I, after discussing with all the players that are on Artemis, I, I, I have an opinion. There's no one single roadmap. There's no uh, just one way for you to engage. It's up to us to understand the, top, the context of the Artemis framework, our capabilities, and trying to find niches where we can add value to the proposal. And we've been doing our homework, and I, I think I invite all these nations that they have just recently uh, signing uh, the Artemis Accords to join us for a workshop that will happen in Montreal at the Canadian Space Agency May this year, where you're gonna have a second opportunity to interact. And we've also been using the IEC as a forum for us to get together and exchange views, opinions, etc. As I said, it's very dynamic. Whatever it will happen is happening right now. In a few years' time, we will have a better understanding how the international scenario is, you know, getting ready for our own exploration. And Emma, if I can just quickly Absolutely. echo and applaud what Rodrigo just said, the accords were developed with this question explicitly in mind. We wanted to ensure that no matter how large or robust the country was or how small or modest its capabilities were, that there was a place for them in the Artemis Accords. So absolutely thrilled to have a large, wealthy and, and incredibly developed country like Brazil, but also to have Ecuador, to have Colombia. I'm especially pleased when we have nations sign the Accords that haven't even thought about space yet or don't have a space agency. The accords are a way for them to take that first step. And as Rodrigo's describing, it's a family of nations. And I'm so grateful for Rodrigo and Brazil bringing accords, nations together regionally to find ways for them to participate and join in this journey of discovery and bring the benefits of space, the wonder of space to all of the citizens of the world. Thank you very much, Mike. I have a very last, last question because we have too many people keep asking because they know that you are, uh, this is a, a unique opportunity. Mike, this is for you, it's a bit provocative, but I would be interested in knowing you. So your opinion uh, is from Farid. The Artemis, what do you think the Artemis Accords were not discussed within the UN, um, at the UN level? Because the UN already did its job that the UN has done a tremendous service to humanity with the Outer Space Treaty, again, the backbone, the very spine of international space law, the registration convention, the agreement on the rescue of astronauts. What the UN has not and cannot do is implement those treaties. I can't take the Outer Space Treaty and hand it to NASA's operational team and say, here, do this. 
The Artemis Accords are an attempt to take the Outer Space Treaty values down a level to say, yes, we should avoid harmful interference, for example, as the treaty says. Now, how are you going to go about doing that? That's, for example, where safety zones came from, the ability that you must notify the UN, notify the public where you are, what you're doing, and then coordinate, talk to any other entity in the area. So you need to think of the accords not necessarily separate or independent from the UN activities and treaties, but again, a way of implementing those treaties. If we don't implement the treaties and take actions as they're described in the accords, then they're just words on paper. And I very much want those values, the obligations, the principles of the Outer Space Treaty to transition from thought to reality. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike, it's been a pleasure. Rodrigo, I really loved this interaction between the two of you. I feel like a good energy. <laughs> we might, we should do it again. Okay, I'm gonna close up. I'm sorry for lasting a bit longer, but just saw a lot of questions. There was obviously a lot of vitality and energy in the chat. Everybody wanted to ask you questions, so I stole a bit of more of your time. We're gonna close down. Hashtag Artemis, please remember it. The chance to win a quest, the win to win a t-shirt. Do we have our raffle ready? I don't know. Yes, no. Torsten. Yes. Okay. Waiting, waiting for the big screen to pop up here and do the raffle. We have at least more people in the in the draw than yes. last time. That is great. <laughs> I can't see how many. Wait. I think it's nine or something like that. And Frank, fire it on. Let us know who's in. Dum, dum, dum. Why am me? No, that's not fair. Neil, Neil Newman is our, our winner. And as you can see, we run our system here on the German computer. So it's give winner. For the rest of the world, it's just winner. So Neil, uh, we get in touch with you or please do get in touch with us that we exchange your, um, your address where we can send it to. And if you are, at the Space Symposium next week, then we also can hand it over to you um, physically. So, and that's congratulations again. And back to Emma for some famous last words. Yes, allow me to first of all thank our guests. I want to thank Mike Gold and uh, Rodrigo Leonardi for being here with us today. It's been a pleasure. I stole a bit more of the of the time, but it was uh, invaluable as usual to have this uh, interesting global conversation. Thank you very much. So that's the most important thing. I want also to thank all our production, of course. Uh, and I thank uh, Torsten for supporting me. And uh, I will say thank you very much for everyone. And uh, I will pass over to you. Uh, Torsten for the program for the next uh, few weeks before we go to Colorado. Thank you very much again, Rodrigo. Thank you, Mike. Stay with us because we still need to upload your videos. So, and yes, we will be on the road again. So, our today and tomorrow, I mean, today it was, but tomorrow uh, it will be the Space Talks Earth 4.0 in Oxfordshire. We have our team from the UK being there so and then in two weeks after the easter break we as i mentioned before we have the great pleasure to be at the 39th space symposium in colorado spring so if you're around reach out for us also the days before we are in colorado springs uh, in, in in denver and um if you would like us to visit your company let us know we are coming along and then after that our our poor team has to go to the maldives again uh, to SYNC24, to the Space of the Island Nations uh, conference. Uh, we've been there last year, and it was a blast. So uh, this year, I think, will be equally cool and great. Poor Torsten has to be in Bremen, uh, uh, not on, on the Maldives, but, I mean, you win, you lose. Uh, but Bremen is always worth uh, travel. So I will be there on the 24th for the BDI New Space Breakfast in the morning, and then followed by the first European Space Plane Summit. What is a super cool um, activities. And so that's it more or less. I think uh, find and subscribe uh, to all your uh, events on our website at spacewatch.global or on social media. 
as always, we would like to hear from you, uh, your feedback, check in with us on X, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. I mean, Facebook is obviously for my generation or my, maybe for our generation, so not for the, for the youngsters. Um, don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-weekly or weekly newsletters or to the new NCIS, as we call it. The Nobody Cares About Your Satellite Newsletter, MRS Space Communication Newsletter. And I think it's about to come out later this week, if I'm not mistaken. It's months is over. Great, in the second edition. Yes. Um, if you like uh, what you have seen, support us um, in our Space Watcher uh, program, the Business Club program, or get yourself a Space Watcher t-shirt today and to become a Space Watcher. That's it. Uh, thank you very much for your interest to, today. Thank you, Emma, Mike, and Rodrigo for this inspiring conversation. Thank you, dear audience, uh, for even staying with us almost an hour, joining us, uh, and for the tech team for the smooth operations. Hope to see you in our next events, in our case, in Colorado Springs. In the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a Space Watcher. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.